Chapter 54. We'll leave at noon. No, Mariko-san. Lady Suzuko was almost in tears. Yes, Kiri said. Yes, we'll leave as you say. But they'll stop us, the young girl burst out. It's all so useless. No, Mariko told her, you're wrong, Suzuko-chan, it's very necessary. Kiri said, Mariko-san's right. We have orders. She suggested details of their leaving. We could easily be ready by dawn if you want. Noon is when we should leave. That's what he said, Kiri-chan, Mariko replied. We'll need very few things, nay. Yes. Suzuko said, very few. So sorry, but it's all so silly, they'll stop us. Perhaps they won't, child, Kiri said. Mariko says they'll let us go. Lord Toranaga thinks they'll let us go. So presume that they will. Go and rest. Go on. I must talk to Mariko-san. The girl went away, greatly troubled. Kiri folded her hands. Yes, Mariko-san. I'm sending a cipher by carrier pigeon telling Lord Toranaga what happened tonight. It will go at first light. Ishido's men will certainly try to destroy the rest of my carrier birds tomorrow if there's trouble and I can't bring them here. Is there any message you want to send at once? Yes. I'll write it now. What do you think's going to happen? Lord Toranaga's sure they'll let us go, if I'm strong. I don't agree. And, please excuse me, I don't think you put much faith in the attempt either. You're wrong. Oh, of course they may stop us tomorrow and if they do there'll be the most terrible quarrel and threats but they'll all mean nothing. Mariko laughed. Oh, such threats, Kiri-san, and they'll go on all day and all night. But at noon the next day we'll be allowed to go. Kiri shook her head. If we're allowed to escape, every other hostage in Osaka will leave too. Ishido will be weakened badly and he'll lose face. He can't afford that. Yes. Mariko was very satisfied. Even so, he's trapped. Kiri watched her. In 18 days our master'll be here, nay. He must be here. Yes. So sorry, then why is it so important for us to leave at once? He thinks it important enough, Kiri-san. Enough to order it. Ah, then he has a plan. Doesn't he always have many plans? Once the exalted one agreed to be present, then our master was trapped, nay. Yes. Kiri glanced at the shoji door. It was closed. She leaned forward and said softly, then why did he ask me secretly to put that thought into the Lady Okiba's head? Mariko's confidence began to fade. He told you to do that? Yes. From Yoko's A, after he'd seen Lord Zataki for the first time. Why did he spring the trap himself? I don't know. Kiri bit her lips. I wish I knew. We'll soon know, but I don't think you're telling me everything you know, Mariko-chan. Mariko began to bridle but Kiri touched her, again cautioning her to silence, and whispered. His dispatch to me told me to trust you completely so let's say no more than that. I do trust you, Mariko-chan, but that doesn't stop my mind from working. Nay, please excuse me. I'm so proud of you, Kiri said in a normal voice. Yes, standing up like that to Ishido and all of them. I wish I had your courage. It is easy for me. Our master said we were to leave. It's very dangerous, what we do, I think. Even so, how can I help? Give me your support. You have that. You've always had that. I'll stay here with you till dawn, Kiri. But first I have to talk to the Anjin san Yes, I'd better go with you. The two women left Kiri's apartments, an escort of Browns with them, passing other Browns who bowed, clearly enormously proud of Mariko. Kiri led down corridors, across the expanse of the great audience room, and into the corridor beyond. Browns were on guard here, and Greys. When they saw Mariko, all bowed, Browns and Greys equally honoring her. Both Kiri and Mariko were taken aback to find Greys in the domain. They hid the discomfiture and said nothing. Kiri motioned at a door. Anjin San. Mariko called out. Hi. The door opened. Blackthorn stood there. 
Behind him in the room were two more greys. Hello, Mariko-san. Hello. Mariko glanced at the greys. I have to talk to the engine-san privately. Please talk to him, lady, their captain said with great deference. Unfortunately we are ordered by Lord Ishido personally on pain of immediate death not to leave him alone. Yoshinaka, tonight's officer of the watch, strode up. Excuse me, Lady Toda, I had to agree to these twenty guards for the Anjin San. It was Lord Ishido's personal request. So sorry. As Lord Ishido is only concerned with the Anjin San's safety, they're welcome, she said, not at all pleased inside. Yoshinaka said to the captain of the Greys, I will be responsible for him while the Lady Toda's with him. You can wait outside. So sorry, this samurai said firmly. I and my men have no alternative but to watch with our own eyes. Kiri said, I will be glad to stay. Of course someone's necessary. So sorry, Kiritsubo-san, we must be present. Please excuse me, Lady Toda, the captain continued uncomfortably, but none of us speaks the barbarian. No one suggests you would be so impolite as to listen, said Mariko, near anger. But barbarian customs are different from ours. Yoshinaka said, obviously the greys must obey their lord. You were totally correct tonight that a samurai's first duty is to his liege lord, Lady Toda, and totally correct to point it out in public. Perfectly correct, lady, the captain of the greys agreed with the same measure of pride. There's no other reason for a samurai's life, nay. Thank you, she said, warmed by their respect. We should also honor the Anjin San's customs if we can, Captain, Yoshinaka said. Perhaps I have a solution. Please follow me. He led the way back to the audience room. Please, lady, would you take the Anjin San and sit there? He pointed to the far dais. The Anjin San's guards can stay by the doors and do the duty to their liege lord, we can do ours, and you may talk as you wish, according to the Anjin San's customs. Nay. Mariko explained to Blackthorn what Yoshinaka had said, then continued prudently in Latin, they will never leave thee tonight. We have no alternative, except I can order them killed at once if that is thy wish. My wish is to talk to thee privately, Blackthorn replied. But not at the cost of lives. I thank thee for asking me. Mariko turned to Yoshinaka. Very well, thank you, Yoshinaka-san. Would you please send someone for incense braziers to keep away the mosquitoes? Of course. Please excuse me, lady, is there any further news of the Lady Yodoko? No, Yoshinaka-san. We heard she's still resting easily, without pain. Mariko smiled at Blackthorn. Shall we go and sit there, Anjin-san? He followed her. Kiri went back to her own quarters and the greys stood at the doors of the audience room. The captain of the greys was near Yoshinaka, a few paces away from the others. I don't like this, he whispered roughly. Is the Lady Toda going to pull out his sword and kill him? No offense, but where are your wits? Yoshinaka limped away to check the other posts. The captain looked at the dais. Mariko and the Anjin San were seated opposite each other, well lit by flares. He could not hear what they were saying. He focused on their lips but was still no wiser, though his eyes were very good and he could speak Portuguese. I suppose the talking the Holy Father's language again, he told himself. Hideous language, impossible to learn. Still, what does it matter? Why shouldn't she talk to the heretic in private if that's her pleasure? Neither are long for this earth. So very sad. Oh, blessed Madonna, take her forever into thy keeping for her bravery. Latin is safer, Anjin San. Her fan sent a droning mosquito skittering. They can hear us from here. No, I do not believe so, not if we keep our voices softened and talk as thou hast taught me with so little movement of the mouth. Good. What occurred with Kiyama? I love thee. Thou. I have missed thee. And I thee. How can we meet alone? Tonight it is not possible. Tomorrow night will be possible, my love. I have a plan. Tomorrow. But what about thy departure? 
Tomorrow they may stop me, Anjin san, please do not worry. The next day we will all be free to leave as we wish. Tomorrow night, if I am stopped, I will be with thee. How? Kiri will help me. Do not ask me how or what or why. It will be easy, she stopped as maids brought the little braziers. Soon the curling threads of smoke repelled the night creatures. When they were safe again they talked about their journey, content just being together, loving without touching, always skirting Toranaga and the importance of tomorrow. Then he said, Ishido's my enemy. Why are there so many guards around me? To protect thee, but also to hold thee tight. I think Ishido might also want to use thee against the black ship, and Nagasaki and the Lord Kiyama and Lord Onishi. Ah, yes, I had thought that too. She saw his eyes searching her. What is it, Anjin-san? Contrary to what Yabu believes, I believe thou art not stupid, that everything tonight was said deliberately, planned deliberately, on Toranaga's orders. She smoothed a crease in her brocade kimono. He gave me orders. Yes. Blackthorn turned to Portuguese, he's betrayed you. You're a decoy. Do you know that? You're just bait for one of his traps. Why do you say that? You're the bait. So am I. It's obvious, isn't it? Yabu's bait. Toranaga sent us all here as a sacrifice. No, you're wrong, Anjin-san. So sorry, but you're wrong. In Latin he said, I tell thee that thou art beautiful and I love thee, but thou art a liar. No one has ever said that to me before. Thou hast also said no one ever said, I love thee, before. She looked down at her fan. Let us talk of other things. What does Toranaga gain by sacrificing us? She did not answer. Mariko-san, I have the right to ask thee. I'm not afraid. I just want to know what he gains. I don't know. Thou, swear by thy love and thy God. Even thee, she replied bitterly in Latin. Thou also with thy, swear before God, and questions and questions and questions. It is thy life and my life and I cherish both. Again, what does he gain? Her voice became louder. Listen thou, yes, I chose the time and yes, I am not a stupid woman and... Be cautious, Mariko-chan, please keep thy voice down or that would be very stupid. So sorry. Yes, it was done deliberately and in public as Toranaga wished. Why? Because Ishido's a peasant and he must let us go. The challenge had to be before his peers. The Lady Okiba approves our going to meet Lord Toranaga. I talked to her and she is not opposed. There's nothing to trouble thyself about. I do not like to see fire in thee, or venom, or crossness. Where is thy tranquility, and where are thy manners? Perhaps thou should learn to watch the rocks growing. Nay, Mariko's anger vanished and she laughed. Ah, thee, thou art right. Please forgive me. She felt refreshed, herself again. Oh, how I love thee, and honor thee, and I was so proud of thee tonight I almost kissed thee there in front of them as is thy custom. Madonna, that would have set fire in their tinderboxes, nay. If I were alone with thee I would kiss thee until thy cries for mercy filled the universe. I thank thee, lady, but thou art there and I am here and the world's between us. Ah, but there's no world between us. My life is full because of thee. In a moment he said, and Yabu's orders to you, to apologize and stay. They may not be obeyed, so sorry. Because of Toranaga's orders. Yes. But not his orders truly, it is also my wish. All this was my suggestion to him. It is I who begged to be allowed to come here, my darling. Before God that is the truth. What will happen tomorrow? She told him what she had told Kiri, adding, everything is going to be better than planned. Isn't Ishido already thy patron? I swear I do not know how Lord Toranaga can be so clever. Before I left he told me that would happen, might happen. He knew that Yabu has no power in Kyushu. Only Ishido or Kiyama could protect thee there. We are not decoys. We are in his protection. We're quite safe. What about the 19 days, 18 now? 
Torinaga must be here, nay. Yes. Then isn't this as Ishido says, a waste of time. Truly I don't know. I only know that 19, 18, or even 3 days can be an eternity. Or tomorrow. Tomorrow also. Or the next day. And if Ishido will not let thee go tomorrow. This is the only chance we have. All of us. Ishido must be humbled. Thou art certain. Yes, before God, Anjin San. Blackthorn clawed out of a nightmare again but the moment he was truly awake the dream vanished. Greys were staring at him through the mosquito net in the light of early dawn. Good morning, he said to them, hating to have been watched while he slept. He came from under the net and went out into the corridor, down staircases, until he came to the garden toilet. Guards, both browns and greys, accompanied him. He hardly noticed them. The dawn was smoky. The sky to the east was already burnt clean of the haze. The air smelled salt and wet from the sea. Flies already swarmed. It'll be hot today, he thought. Footsteps approached. Through the door opening he saw Chimoko. She waited patiently, chatting with the guards, and when he came out she bowed and greeted him. Where Mariko-san? He asked. With Kiritsubo-san, Anjin-san. Thank you. When leave? Soon, sire. Say to Mariko-san like say good morning before leave. He said it again although Mariko had already promised to find him before she went back to her home to collect her belongings. Yes, Anjin-san. He nodded as a samurai should and left her and went to wash and bathe. It was not custom to have a hot bath in the morning. But every morning he would always go there and pour cold water all over himself. Eeeeeee, Anjin San, his guards or watchers would always say, that surely is most very good for your health. He dressed and went to the battlements that overlooked the forecourt of this castle wing. He wore a brown kimono and swords, his pistol concealed under his sash. Browns on sentry duty welcomed him as one of them, though very disquieted by his greys. Other greys teamed on the battlements opposite, overlooking him, and outside the gate. Many greys, many more than usual. Understand, Anjin San, Yoshinaka said, coming out onto the balcony. Yes. The captain of the greys moved up to them. Please don't go too near the edge, Anjin San. So sorry. The sun was on the horizon. Its warmth felt good on Blackthorn's skin. There were no clouds in the sky and the breeze was dying. The captain of the greys pointed at Blackthorn's sword. Is that oil seller, Anjin San? Yes, Captain. May I be allowed to see the blade? Blackthorn drew the sword part way from its scabbard. Custom decreed a sword should not be totally drawn unless it was to be used. Eee, beautiful, nay. The Captain said. The others, browns and greys, crowded round, equally impressed. Blackthorn shoved the sword back, not displeased. Honor to wear oil cellar. Can you use a sword, Anjin San? The captain asked. No, captain. Not as samurai. But I learn. Ah, yes. That's very good. In the forecourt two stories below, Browns were exercising, still in shadow. Blackthorn watched them. How many samurai here, Yoshinaka San? 403, Anjin San, including 200 that came with me. And out there, greys. Yoshinaka laughed. Lots, very many. The greys captain showed his teeth with his grin. Almost 100,000. You understand, Anjin San, 100,000. Yes. Thank you. They all looked away as a phalanx of porters and pack horses and three palanquins rounded the far corner and approached under guard from the end of the access to this cul de sac. The avenue was still deeply shadowed and dark between the tall guarded walls. Flares still burned in wall sockets. Even from this distance they could see the nervousness of the porters. Greys across from them seemed more hushed and attentive, and so did the browns on guard. The tall gates opened to admit the party, their escorting greys staying outside with their comrades, then closed again. The great iron bar clanged back into the large brackets that were set deep into the granite walls. 
No portcullis guarded this gateway. Yoshinaka said, Anjin-san, please excuse me. I must see all is well. Already, nay. I wait here. Yes. Yoshinaka left. The Grey's captain went to the parapet and watched below. Christ Jesus, Blackthorn was thinking, I hope she's right and Toranaga's right. Not long now, eh? He measured the sun and muttered vaguely to himself in Portuguese, not long to go. Unconsciously the captain grunted his agreement and Blackthorn realized the man understood him clearly in Portuguese, was therefore Catholic and another possible assassin. His mind rushed back to last night, and he remembered that everything he had said to Marico had been in Latin. Was it all in Latin? Mother of God, what about her saying? I can order them killed. Was that in Latin? Does he speak Latin, too, like that other captain, the one who was killed during the first escape from Osaka? The sun was gathering strength now and Blackthorn took his eyes off the captain of Greys. If you didn't murder me in the night maybe you'll never do it, he thought, putting this Catholic into a compartment. He saw Kiri come out into the forecourt below. She was supervising maids bearing panniers and chests for the pack horses. She looked tiny, standing on the main steps where Sazuko had pretended to slip, initiating Toranaga's escape. Just to the north was the lovely garden and tiny rustic house where he'd first seen Mariko and Yemen, the heir. His mind journeyed with the noon cortege out of the castle, curling through the maze, then safely out, through the woods, and down to the sea. He prayed that she would be safe and everyone safe. Once they were away, Yabu and he would leave and go to the galley and out to sea. From here on the battlements the sea seemed so near. The sea beckoned. And the horizon. Konbanwa, Anjin San. Mariko San. She was as radiant as ever. Konbanwa, he said, then in Latin, nonchalantly, beware of this grey man. He understands, continuing instantly in Portuguese to give her time to cover. Yes, I don't understand how you can be so beautiful after so little sleep. He took her arm and put her back to the captain, guiding her nearer the parapet. Look, this Kiritsubo san. Thank you. Yes, yes, I'm, thank you. Why don't you wave to Kiritsubo san? She did as she was asked and called out her name. Kiri saw them and waved back. After a moment, relaxed again and in control, Mariko said, Thank you, Anjin san. You're very clever and very wise. She greeted the captain casually and wandered to a ledge and sat down, first making sure that the seat was clean. It's going to be a fine day, nay. Yes. How did you sleep? I didn't, Anjin san. Kiri and I chatted the last of the night away and I saw the dawn come. I love dawns. You. My rest was disturbed but. Oh, so sorry. I'm fine now, really. You're leaving now. Yes, but I'll be back at noon to collect Kiri-san and the Lady Sazuko. She turned her face away from the captain and said in Latin, Thou. Remember the Inn of the Blossoms. Assuredly. How could I forget? If there is a delay, tonight will be thus, as perfect and as peace-filled. Ah, that that could be possible. But I would prefer thee safely on thy way. Mariko continued in Portuguese. No I must go, Anjin San. You will please excuse me. I'll take you to the gate. No, please. Watch me from here. You and the captain can watch from here, nay. Of course, Blackthorn said at once, understanding. Go with God. And thee. He stayed on the parapet. While he waited sunlight fell into the forecourt thrusting the shadows away. Mariko appeared below. He saw her greet Kiri and Yoshinaka and they chatted together, no enemy greys near them. Then they bowed. She looked up at him, shading her eyes, and waved gaily. He waved back. The gates were pushed aside and, with Chimoko a few discreet paces behind her, she walked out, accompanied by her escort of ten browns. The gates swung closed once more. For a moment she was lost from view. When she reappeared, fifty greys from the swarm outside their walls had surrounded them as a further honor guard. The cortege marched away down the sunless avenue.
He watched her until she had turned the far corner. She never looked back. Go leave now, Captain, he said. Yes, of course, Anjan San. Blackthorn went to his own quarters and ate rice, pickled vegetables, and broiled chunks of fish, followed by early fruit from Kyushu, crisp small apples, apricots, and hard-fleshed plums. He savored the tart fruit and the char. More, Anjan San, the servant asked. No, thank you. He offered fruits to his guards and they were accepted gratefully, and when they had finished, he went back to the sunny battlements again. He would have liked to examine the priming of his concealed pistol but he thought it better not to draw attention to it. He had checked it once in the night as best he could under the sheet, under the mosquito net. But without actually seeing, he could not be sure of the tamping or the flint. There's nothing more you can do, he thought. You're a puppet. Be patient, Anjan San, your watch ends at noon. He gauged the height of the sun. It will be the beginning of the two-hour period of the snake. After the snake comes the horse. In the middle of the horse is high noon. Temple bells throughout the castle and the city told the beginning of the snake and he was pleased with his accuracy. He noticed a small stone on the battlement floor. He went forward and picked up the stone and placed it carefully on a ledge of an embrasure in the sun, then leaned back once more, cropping his feet comfortably, and stared at it. Greys were watching his every movement. The captain frowned. After a while he said, Anjan San, what's the significance of the stone? Please. The stone. Why stone, Anjan San? Ah. I watch stone grow. Oh so sorry, I understand, the captain replied apologetically. Please excuse me for disturbing you. Blackthorn laughed to himself, and turned his gaze back to the stone. Grow, you bastard, he said. But as much as he cursed it, ordered it, or cajoled it, it would not grow. Do you really expect to see a rock growing? He asked himself. No, of course not, but it passes the time and promotes tranquility. You can't have enough wa. Nay. Eeeeeeeee, where's the next attack coming from? There's no defense against an assassin if the assassin is prepared to die. Is there? Rodriguez checked the priming of a musket he had taken at random from the rack beside the stern cannon. He found the flint was worn and pitted and therefore dangerous. Without a word he hurled the musket at the gunner. The man just managed to catch it before the stock smashed into his face. Madonna, Senhor Pilot, the man cried out, there's no need. Listen, you motherless turd, the next time I find anything wrong with a musket or cannon during your watch, you'll get 50 lashes and lose three months' pay. Bosun. Yes, Pilot. Pazero, the bosun, heaved his bulk nearer and scowled at the young gunner. Turn out both watches. Check every musket and cannon, everything. Only God knows when we'll need em. I'll see to it, pilot. The bosun shoved his face at the gunner. I'll piss in your grog tonight, Gomez, for all the extra work and, you'd better lap it up with a smile. Get to work. There were eight small cannon amidships on the main deck, four port and four starboard and a bow chaser. Enough to beat off any uncannoned pirates but not enough to press home an attack. The small frigate was too mastered, called the Santa Luz. Rodriguez waited until the crews were at their tasks, then turned away and leaned on the gunwale. The castle glinted dully in the sun, the color of old pewter, except for the donjon with its blue and white walls and golden roofs. He spat into the water and watched the spittle to see if it would reach the jetty pilings as he hoped or go into the sea. It went into the sea. Pierce, he muttered to no one wishing he had his own frigate, the Santa Maria, under him right now. God cursed bad luck that she's in Macau just when we need her. What's amiss, Captain General? He had asked a few days ago at Nagasaki when he'd been rooted out of his warm bed in his house that overlooked the city and the harbor. I've got to get to Osaka at once, Ferriera had said, plumed and arrogant as any bantam cock, even at this early hour. An urgent signals arrived from Delacqua. What's the matter now? He didn't say, just that it was vital to the future of the black ship. Madonna, what mischief they up to now? 
What's vital? Our ship's as sound as any ship afloat, her bottoms clean and rigging perfect. Trades better than we ever imagined and on time, the monkeys behaving themselves, pig ass harem as confident, and he stopped as the thought exploded in his brain. The angels. He's put to sea. I don't know. But if he has. Rodriguez had stared out of the great harbor mouth, half expecting to see Erasmus already blockading there, showing the hated flag of England, waiting there like a rabid dog against the day they'd have to put to sea for Macau and home. Jeez you, mother of God and all saints, let that not happen. What's our fastest way? Launcher. The Santa Luz, Captain General. We can sail within the hour. Listen, the angels can do nothing without men. Don't forget, Madonna, you listen, he can speak their gibberish now, eh? Why can't he use monkeys, eh? There are enough Japo pirates to crew him twenty times over. Yes, but not gunners and not sailors as he'd need, em, um, he's not got time to train Japos. By next year maybe, but not against us. Why in the name of the Madonna and the saints the priests gave him one of the dictionaries I'll never know. Meddling bastards. They must have been possessed by the devil. It's almost as though the angels is protected by the devil. I tell you he's just clever. There are many who've been here for 20 years and can't speak a word of Japo gibberish, but the angels can, eh? I tell you he's given his soul to Satan, and in return for the black arts he's protected. How else do you explain it? How many years have you been trying to talk their tongue and you even live with one? Leche, he could easily use Japo pirates. No, Captain General, he's got to get men from here and we're waiting for him and you've already put anyone suspect in irons. With 20,000 crusados in silver and a promise about the black ship, he can buy all the men he needs, including the jailers and the god-cursed jail around them. Cabron. Perhaps he can buy you, too. Watch your tongue. You're the motherless, milkless Spaniard, Rodriguez. It's your fault he's alive, you're responsible. Twice you let him escape. The Captain General had squared up to him in rage. You should have killed him when he was in your power. Perhaps, but that's froth on my life's wake, Rodriguez had said bitterly. I went to kill him when I could. Did you? I've told you twenty times. Have you no ears? Or is Spanish dung as usual in your ears as well as in your mouth? His hand had reached for his pistol and the Captain General had drawn his sword, then the frightened Japanese girl was between them. Priest, Rodsan, no angers, no Cora, priest. Christian, priest. The blinding rage had fallen off both of them, and Ferriera had said, I tell you before God, the angels must be devil spawned, I almost killed you, and you me, Rodriguez. I see it clearly now. He's put a spell on all of us, particularly you. Now in the sunshine at Osaka, Rodriguez reached for the crucifix he wore around his neck and he prayed a desperate prayer that he be protected from all warlocks and his immortal soul kept safe from Satan. Isn't the Captain General right, isn't that the only answer, he reasoned again, filled with foreboding. The angel's life is charmed. Now he's an intimate of the Archfian Toranaga, now he's got his ship back and the money back in Waco, in spite of everything, and he does speak like one of them and that's impossible so quickly even with the dictionary, but he did get the dictionary and priceless help. Jesus God and Madonna, take the evil eye off me. Why'd you give the angels the dictionary, father? He had asked Alvito at Mishima. Surely you should have delayed that. Yes, Rodriguez, Father Alvito had told him confidently, and I needn't have gone out of my way to help him. But I'm convinced there's a chance of converting him. I'm so sure. Torinaga's finished now. It's just one man and a soul. I have to try to save him. Priests, Rodriguez thought. Leche on all priests. But not on Delacqua and Alvito. Oh, Madonna, I apologize for all my evil thoughts about him and the father Alvito. Forgive me and bury the angels somehow before I have him in my sights. I do not wish to kill him because of my holy oath, even though, before thee, I know he must die quickly. The duty helmsman turned the hourglass and rang eight bells. It was high noon.